Thank you, Jeremy. Explaining in one sentence what this remarkable fellow Sloane achieved in her career and how she steered ideas made to matter, not only in the private sector, but also for a G20 task force for Argentina overall in her role as Secretary of State for the World Economic Forum, Global Future Council and other organizations would not be at all adequate. So I leave the stage to her to give her full story. A warm welcome to Clarissa Estol, who holds a Master of Science in Management, class of 89, so celebrating her 25th, uh, her 25th reunion with us and sharing how MIT Sloan impacted her life. So welcome, Clarissa. Ok, thank you, Uli. Quiero saludar a todos los Sloanies hispanoparlantes, tanto los que están acá como los que están streaming. Don't worry, I will go on in English. This, is just, uh, this was just to give a flavor of the international perspective of Sloan. I have always thought that the issue of women, the issue of gender, was not important. I've always felt that being a woman would not, was not a disadvantage for me. It was quite the contrary. I got a lot of advantages for being a woman. I think that being a minority makes you stand out. It's like being tall when everybody else is short. Like this here, makes you stand out. People notice you, they remember your name. Now what you do once you have people's attention, that's entirely up to you. You can use it as an advantage or you can let it be a disadvantage. One of my favorite quotes is from Eleanor Roosevelt, and she said that no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. I sometimes quote her as saying, no one can make you, uh, can, can make you uh, be, uh, you know, like this, if you feel inferior without your consent. I, I've always uh, said that to this line to my children when they fight each other. I haven't been very successful though with them, but, uh, <laughs> but I keep trying. Uh, so when I uh, was appointed uh, chairman of the board and CEO of one of the largest banks in Argentina, I was 39 years old. And because I was young and also because I was a woman and the first woman to be appointed in such a position, I got a lot of media attention, and you know, journalists trying to write articles about me and take pictures and inviting me to their programs. And I just didn't understand what all the fuss was about. But I did think about one thing, and I decided that I wasn't going to accept any of those interviews if I didn't have anything specific or anything important to say. I just didn't want to be a guinea pig showed off. So, you know, uh, after a while, even though I had tried to fight it away, you know, I did get uh, quite a big collection of magazine and newspaper articles, and my number one fan, that's my husband, he made this uh, collage for me and he gave it for uh, one of my birthdays. And uh, you can see some stuff here, you know, this is Franco Modigliani with me, and this is George Soros, uh, this is the president of Argentina, and this is, you know, the most powerful CEOs in Latin America. And, you know, this one is in the New York Stock Exchange. And you can see it's 14 men and myself. You know, you know all of them in dark suits and me with an orange blazer. <laughs> Talk about standing out. Uh, so, with, I left the bank after 10 years and I uh, founded a Rural Real Estate Investment Fund. So this is the bank, this is the Rural Real Investment Fund, and then a global fund management company. And then in 2015, there was a change in government in Argentina, and I decided it was time for me to stop complaining about the government and the different government administrations. You know, complaining about the government is a national sport in Argentina. It's even more popular than football, really. <laughs> so I decided it was time for me to do something and to be part of the solution. And I decided to accept a position as Secretary of State in the Ministry of Information and Communication Technologies. 
And I spent two very long but very interesting years working in the public sector. And then when I left, the president of Argentina asked me to chair a task force in the G20. Maybe some of you remember that the G20 was uh, in, in last year, uh, the presidency was held by Argentina. So all the task forces had a chair that was an Argentine person. And this task force was the Business Women Leaders Task Force. Each of the G20 members had to appoint a leading businesswoman, and it was up to the 20 of us to examine ways to increase women participation in the economy and to come up with recommendations to the leaders with respect to empowering women. So I've always thought that we shouldn't fight women and men's differences. I think they're great, our differences are great. We should make the most of them, not fight them. So you never say no to your president, but I was you know, kind of worried that I might do something politically incorrect. So I told him, you know, I'm very honored, but maybe we can think about another person to do this because I'm not sure that I can do it. I might do something like call all the G20 countries and ask them to send a leading businessman along with their woman representative so that we have 20 men and 20 women sitting at the table and discussing together. And to my surprise, the president said, I love the idea, go get it done. So I did, but at the same time, I started studying about this issue because I wasn't an expert. So I, uh, by chance, I came across the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence that was funded by one of uh, my professors, Tom Malone, who's a professor of mine five years ago. Okay, 10 years ago. <laughs> And uh, they study what make any group of people, could be an army, a family, you know, a company, what makes it collectively intelligent. And one of the things that they found out, and it's quite interesting because it's quite counterintuitive, is that collective intelligence is only moderately related to individual intelligence, only moderately. There are three issues that explain collective intelligence more closely. And the first one is the social perceptiveness of the people in the group. And this is the ability to read the emotions in other people. And you can actually measure social perceptiveness with a test that is called read the mind in the eyes, where you're shown different eyes and you have to figure out what emotions these people are going through. And it's not something easy like happy, sad, angry, it's you know, one of those things, you know, some of them, I even didn't know what they meant. I had to look them up in the dictionary, like a gust. I don't know what that is. Uh, so with this test, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can see how socially perceptive a person is. The second issue that makes a group collectively intelligent is the equal participation of the members. It's useless to have highly socially perceptive people if only one or two are gonna monopolize the discussion, and so you lose the benefits of brainstorming. So equal participation is very important. And the third one is the number of women in the group. The larger the percentage of women, the more collective intelligent a group is. And as you might have guessed, this third issue is highly correlated with the first one, with the social perceptiveness, because women, are usually more socially perceptive than men. No offense taken, sorry. <laughs> so this topic about women and gender is a hot issue right now, but it wasn't quite an issue 100 years ago, and it's probably not gonna be an issue 100 years from now. You know, it is said that forecasting is very difficult, especially when it refers to the future. And George Soros used to say that if you're asked to forecast a certain variable for the future, of course, then you should do it for far, very far away in the future so that when the time comes, nobody remembers what you said. <laughs> so I'm gonna try and do that for 100 years from now. And I think that 100 years from now, the word gender might have a completely different meaning. 100 years from now, companies might be truly indifferent as to whether they hire a man or a woman for a certain position. And 100 years from now, governments might not need to implement mandatory policies such as quotas or minimum women on boards to increase the participation of women.
And I've highlighted the word might because, again, we don't know what the future will look like. But there's one thing that I'm certain of, and that's that in 100 years from now, we will still need each other, and we will need different views more than ever. Thank you very much.